Hey everybody, this is Breaking Down Security. Welcome back everybody. This is Brian and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. Hello. Been a serious last couple of weeks. I mean, we uh, we had Mr. Tim Wood, or as I like to misspell his name, Time Wood on uh, LinkedIn. Oh, God. What is it, man? I don't know what it is about me and posts. It's like Time Wood. And I'm like, ah. And Well, it's you and names, you know, in any format, verbal or written. I know. I know. I just, I, I you know, I shouldn't try posting things at 11 p.m. at night after I'm about half asleep and and trying to yeah. do things so but uh tim tim wood uh are you a boozer you're a boozer uh, no i'm not a boozer i just uh i'm not uh i'm not as old young as i used to feel so um <laughs> yeah but yeah tim was great uh i i appreciated his insights into itil and um it, it was great uh, listening to him talk about something he's obviously passionate about because i mean he was passionate enough to make a 41 slide presentation on itil and how it works with security. So that that's some passion, man, I'm telling you. Just for the podcast, too. Yeah, I know. That was excellent. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, uh, how it lines up with security, security programs and, and IT service, you know, <clears throat> in general. I know um, I've been a part of companies who did it right and companies who did it wrong. And uh, it is it is such a relief to be able to, you know, um, to, to rest assured that if you put in a ticket for an issue that somebody's going to look at it in a timely manner and you won't have to spend most of your time chasing down people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things I didn't realize I till was, uh, it could be phased in or it can be, you know, done piecemeal or, you know, it can be done, uh, in a, in a, in a smaller scale format than a, you know, business wide, you could have a whole division just based on doing what's ITIL or, you know, uh, picking certain parts that, uh, to make sense to your organization. So, right. Yeah. I liked that. So Mr. Batcher, what are we doing this week on breaking down security? <clears throat> I think we're going to talk about buffer overruns. Oh God. We're going to get back to our roots and, and get a little technical here and, uh, talk about something that, that, I think all security people at least should be aware of, maybe not be able to uh, get down in code or do a code audit to look for these things. But when, you know, somebody talks about buffer overflows, buffer underruns, uh, you know, you should know what that is and to be able to speak the language, right? Yeah. Somebody's going to get technical because I do not come from a programming background. That would be Mr. Betcher who got his computer science degree from some college, uh, university of, you know, Texas at Austin or someplace like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Coding, uh, uh, is my background. I was a level one developer before I moved into, you know, the management and the support space and then got into security after that. So, so yeah, I do a little bit of coding every once in a while. And uh, buffer overflows is something that I look for regularly, you know. And if I'm just um, coding up a, you know, a quick script or something, I, I might put a comment, hey, this has a potential for a buffer overflow, you know, like if I hard code a value, something like that. That way, if, uh, th if I turn it into something bigger later on, I'll know, oh, yeah, um, I got to look at this. Or if somebody else is going to review the code, I might want to fix that before I hand it off. Yep. So when when we first started looking at this, uh, kind of a little behind the scenes here, he said, oh, yeah, we're going to do buffer overruns. And I was like, wait a minute, buffer overruns? That's what I used to have issues with on CD burners or whatever when I would, you know, when the data wouldn't uh, wouldn't fill the buffer quick enough and it would, you know, mess up all my CDs and DVDs. He's like, no, 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 no. Buffer overruns. Yeah. And then he gave me this book. It's called... Uh, the 24 Deadly Sins of Software Security, Programming Flaws, and How to Fix Them. Uh, we'll have this uh, a link to Amazon in our show notes. Uh, written by Michael Howard, David LeBlanc, and John Viega. Um, 
Michael Howard is uh, kind of a big deal at my, uh, he was or is in Microsoft, um, where he does uh, a blog, uh, and um, I, I'm not sure. Let's where- just say he 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 was there since you know we want to kind of make this episode timeless, right? Yeah. Oh, true. Yes, he he worked at a company at one time <laughs> that he may not work at now. Um, in the future. Or in the future, yes. Um, so, but. Yeah, you can find him online. Uh, he he had a blog. He may still have a blog. He may have a blog in the future. There you go. Is that, is that future proof <laughs> enough for you? <laughs> that that covers it. All right. So what is a buffer overrun? Yes, what is a Did buffer you... overrun? Well, a buffer is like a allocation in memory. Typically, it's, um, uh, you know, a block, sequential block in memory, and uh, they call it a buffer. Okay, it's like an array. Okay, uh, you hear of string buffers or whatever, but it's it's really uh, an area in memory, sequential that you put or store values. Now it can be um, stack or heap, and we'll get into that. But but it's it's basically an array of of values, and that array has a fixed size. And uh, what a buffer overflow is 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 somehow you get outside of those bounds that an array is. And in lower level languages like C, um, you can actually over overwrite memory, um, and and we'll talk about some of the ways you can do that. So you can actually read memory from outside of the, um, you know, that array. That sounds like um, what was it? Hardbleed was a was a buffer overflow kind of thing or a buffer overrun kind of deal, wasn't it? Where you take a um, a request and say, okay, my, you know, this value had eight bits, but you know, I expect 150 back or something. And it would read everything in the first eight plus the, the, the remaining extra bits that were in memory. So it was, it was overflowing the buffer and sending back 150 bits, right? Is that type of uh, buffer overflow you're talking about? Don't get me lying. Um, <laughs> I don't remember uh, the technical details of that, but but yeah, if it is as you described, that would be a buffer overflow, certainly. Okay. And I think uh, the terms are used synonymously. I was looking at what's the difference between a overrun and a and a overflow, and uh, some websites said it's the difference between reading and writing. I'm not I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the definitions are pretty much synonymous. And in the book Twenty Four Deadly Sins, the the chapter is called buffer overruns, but they the examples they give from CWE. And what is CWE, by the way? We'll get into that. And then uh, they say, you know, all the examples are buffer overflow. Okay, so according, so. I, I looked on the Wikipedia while you were explaining that, and it's uh, Heartbleed was a buffer overread. It is an anomaly or program while reading data from a buffer overruns the buffer's boundaries and reads or tries to read adjacent memory. It's a special case of violation of memory safety. There you so go. So it is a kind of buffer So we'll talk overflow. about... So we'll talk talk about some different types, not all, and then uh, we'll get into uh, an example or two, and then you know what do you do to um, to help mitigate this, mm-hmm. all right, or detect it. All right. So um, let's go into a few different types. Uh, we've have we have stack based buffer overflows. Now the difference between the stack and the heap is the stack is uh, you know known at compile time. So when you compile your code. Uh, everything that's known goes on the stack and everything that's or anything that's not uh, known at compile time say you read from a file uh, values then that that'll go on the heap so uh, stack base is uh, you know your buffers placed on the stack and it's typically a hard-coded size Uh, and then one way you can get a stack based buffer overflow is if you have some sort of an input from somewhere that's a variable size or that you don't trust right so if you do read in a file or user input and stick that in in the stack that could overflow so for example you put in uh, you build an array of size 10 but you read input from the user um, that's more than 10 well you're going to have an overflow if you're not checking for that condition and saying ah you exceeded the boundaries why don't you try again that kind of thing Mm -hmm. okay so um 
the idea is if you have a very you can set variables equal to so many bit lengths um you can well like if you have an array of 10 values now those values can be different sizes like a a, a wide character like a unicode or a regular character mm -hmm. Um, that kind of thing. They they come in different sizes, and the compiler will know how big this how how big each one of those is. But typically, it's a it's a numbered value, right? Mm -hmm. As to how long this buffer is, according to what size of um, you know thing you're going to place in there. Okay, and you said that so so the so a stack is what happens. At compile time. At compile time. Okay, and a heap is post compile. Yep, runtime. Okay, so when you're when you're compiling the program, you can actually cause buffer overflows. And after, let's say, the code is run properly and it compiles properly, just the execution of it can cause additional heap overflows on the back end. The um... The stack is what is used or known at compile time. Okay. That the compiler knows about. And then the heap would be uh, anything that is unknown at compile time. And it's it's basically runtime storage. Okay. <clears throat> so two different things. You allocate memory and deallocate memory. So in C, if you allocate memory on the heap, you need to deallocate it. And that's that's where you can run into... Um, memory leaks. If you don't okay. deallocate memory uh, on the heap, you know, the compiler knows about stuff that's on the stack, so it's going to deallocate it properly, but stuff that it doesn't know about, uh, you have to do that. And that's where, like, things that Java does well is is uh, it has a garbage collector, so you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, so... Um, a heap-based buffer overflow is is something that's memory that's dynam uh, dynamically allocated, and then that overflows. So it's it's very similar, except it's on the heap. That's the only difference. Okay. So yeah, you you get maybe you would allocate the size at runtime. You don't know it ahead of time, so maybe user input, and then you take more user input or hard coded values that exceed. Uh, you know the values that you built on the heap. Okay. Yep. So and then there's so okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry because I am absolutely not completely lost, but I understand. So when you're compiling code and you have mm -hmm. known values, those can cause stack-based overflows. But when you're compiling some code, you have known values and unknown values. The known values can cause the stack-based overflows, and the unknown values, which are dynamic or in flux or can be set after you've compiled the code can cause the heap based overflows. That's right. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, um, I'm only asking for clarification because I'm sure there was somebody out there who was like, huh? Because you yeah. know, we're not all coming from a programming background. So, so just one clarification of what you said, the stack based overflows, they're built on the stack, you know, mm -hmm. but, they could take user input that would overflow that after at runtime. So it's located on the stack. Mm -hmm. The memory is. Sure. However, the uh, the program is accepting user input for that memory allocation on the stack. Okay. You, you, you could get things like, oh, I don't know, um, maybe if you... Um, Let's see. We don't have an example like that in our show notes, but uh, what comes to mind on on a stack based overflow is maybe you do recursion and you have an infinite uh, recursion or something that overflows the stack that way. If you do recursion that's uh, too large for the stack, you're going to get a stack based overflow there. Okay. Um, and then uh, next uh, is buffer underwrite. It's uh, basically me referencing memory locations prior to the beginning of the buffer. Okay, so if you do some calculations and you end up going like less than less than zero, mm -hmm. right? So you allocate memory and you uh, you know you're trying to read something that's 
under what you've allocated. That's called a buffer underwrite. And I don't, I don't really see a difference under, over, you know, who cares? Now, if you're underutilizing, right? if you're underutilizing a buffer, how's that a bad thing? It's not underutilizing. It's trying to access memory. Like say you have an array of 10 values and uh, you want to try and access negative one, let's say. Yeah, you can't access negative one. Yeah. So that's what I think is meant by buffer underwrite. Okay. Oh. Prior to the beginning of the buffer. I see. And, uh, and then, of course, you have your off by one error. You know what that is, right? Off by one is that a trick? It's, it's is that pretty a trick common. Question? No, it's not a trick question. Okay. So so yeah, off by one. It's pretty common. Uh, people say, ah, damn it, off by one. It's uh, you know your the size of your buffer is miscalculated. Um, you you're missing a like say if you have a character array that's null terminated, you're missing that null character, or you use Instead of using less than, you use less than or equal to or vice versa, mm -hmm. things like that. It, that's the most common is um, you're using less than or equal to instead of less than or you started from one and not zero. Ah, uh, right? okay. Because, you know, in programming, you always yeah. start with zero, okay. right? Yeah. All right. I get that. So uh, sometimes that can get the best of us, right? And, and you know, you get that off by one error. So that's what that means. Okay. Uh, then you have a wraparound error. All right, so every um, type in programming has has a particular boundary, right? So an int in C, integer, has like 30, I don't know, 32,000 uh, values Okay. In, in the positive area and 32,000 in negative. So you can go from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000. And uh, it wraps around. So if you're at the max and you add one, it goes back to the negative number. Okay. Negative 32,000. So if, right? if you add so, one to 65, 535, it'll go to negative 65, 535, and that's a bad thing. Right. So uh, an unsigned integer goes to 65, 535. And what's the, uh, what's the 65, 535 that you know? That's the number of ports in a TCP IP uh, um stack <laughs> right so um so there's 65 535 of those and there are no negative ports yeah right so an unsigned integer is used for that so if you add one like say you have a unsigned integer and you've already gotten to that lo that value and you add one to it it rolls back to zero okay very nice right so those are the types of errors programmers can run into that may not be known to them but um, at the time, but then uh, hackers can take advantage of it by, uh, you know, putting in values that exceed those boundaries. So then you have improper validation of an array index, right? So um, it's what I was saying earlier, where if you have um, somebody input, if you have an array of 10 values and somebody inputs, well, I want 12, well, they've exceeded those boundaries, and you're and the programmer is not doing that check to make sure that they get input from either a user or another function, mm -hmm. anything like that, um, that they're within the boundaries of what they're trying to do um, before they keep executing commands. Okay, so an array, an array um, for for a command might be the list of arguments that occur after after a specific command, say. Uh, like when you're running um, nmap or something and you have your dash d dash v dash n dash pn or whatever if nmap is only allowing you four values and you try to put five in it should error out properly but if you're not setting your errors if you're not setting your your um, array uh, index properly it can cause um, overflow yeah, if you're not doing that checks to make sure you're only getting four values, mm -hmm. then there you could have unintended, um, you know, execution. Okay. Right. So that's kind of security 101. Um, basically, um, security is all about um, making sure that you get the proper inputs um, to execute the program, right? Yeah. And hacking is 
you're giving the program uh, inputs that are unexpected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So somebody who does not come from a programming grip background like myself, you actually have quite the leg up. You are, you are the type of person that security companies are looking for because you understand code. You can write code and you can also penetrate, you know, do pen testing of applications and go, okay, well, I can look at this code and tell that there's a buffer overflow here or, um, that there's a, you know, you've got an off by one here and that's going to cause you to have issues. So you're kind of a, yeah, a I mean, when deal. you, when you do, you know, when you have some, obviously when you have someone that needs to be doing code audits, they, they have to understand code. So yeah, it, it all depends on the job that you're doing. You know, you, if, if there's a role that can be filled like that, sure. With, with uh, a programming background, yeah, it helps you to be able to do those types of code audits. And, you know, when, when managers are looking for somebody to fill those types of roles, they're, they're definitely going to want somebody with a coding background there um, to be able to make sense of and talk to developers mm -hmm. uh, and make sense of their code, right? Yeah. All right, and, and there's tons of examples that we can go through. Um, Let's talk about the CWE, right? Sure. The Common Weakness Enumeration. Yeah. Right. That's a website. You want to speak to that? Well, yeah. The that... CWEs were created by uh, uh, MITRE.org, which also created the CVE, which is the Common Vulnerability. Uh, and it's not enumeration, is it? It is enumeration. Or no, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. I did this before. I did this once before when we were talking about CVEs. Common I called it common vulnerability enumeration or whatever. And I got the CWE yeah. and the CVE mixed up, but it's actually common vulnerabilities and exposures list. So old habits. Yeah. Old habits. So this is a, uh, the CWE in this case are common weakness enumerations. And these are basically showing you, um, it's a measurable set of software weaknesses, uh, that allow you to enable, uh, effective discussion and use of tools that can find weaknesses in source code and operational systems. So basically it's a list of, what was it? The, the, the 2.8 version of the CWE has got like 1500 pages in it of different common weaknesses and, and, and vulnerabilities. And what uh, the, the, the book that we're referencing here takes all 1500 or so of these and puts them into 24 categories and some of them are like uh i don't know if it takes all of them these are the 24 most deadly so so if we have you know like we're doing buffer overflows mm -hmm. it it'll it'll give you some examples like a subset but i don't think you can fit all of the common weakness enumerations all 1500 and stick them into 24 categories these are just the deadly sins they you know i'm sure you have some not so deadly sins out there that don't fit in these categories but you know 1500 of them that's a lot yeah just to fit into 22 24 categories so um yeah if you have uh, if somebody mentions something about you know programming that you you don't know about you could go to the website and type in that vulnerability and it gives some great examples of code mm -hmm. if you can read that and explains about how how uh, one would go about number one coding that particular vulnerability or weakness and then number two give examples and three offer suggestions so it's a really good resource to look at when you're <clears throat> when you're doing code reviews or or talking to developers about a certain vulnerability that you found yep. and you may not know um, they may say well I have no idea what that is you can go to this or have them go to this and and find out more about it yep and and some of the things that it talks about I mean uh, the weaknesses span not only software vulnerabilities but there's web vulnerabilities like for instance CWE 384 is session fixation which is a web vulnerability that we've talked about in our OWASP top 10 uh, discussion that's right um, you know there's let's see 431 missing handlers there's uh, it actually has the OWASP top 10 in here at one point I think it's like um uh, like yeah i saw one that was number a, a thousand or whatever i'm just making that yeah, up cwe 711 through 723 are all the owasp top tens from 2007 and 2004 um broken down they have uh you know 
it seems like that this is just a, a massive list of different types of vulnerabilities, sometimes broken down by uh, web or, I mean, they even have like uh, sections on Java and struts and J2E. Uh, now, to be fair, they're not going to have, at least I don't think so, they're not going to have Heartbleed in here, hmm. right? They're going to have uh, the category that Heartbleed was exactly. or what, what caused Heartbleed to happen. Exactly. So you're not going to go in here and find a specific vulnerability for, you know, some uh, off the wall Linksys router. No, you're going to find the what caused that vulnerability in that router, whatever it was. Yep. Yep. You know, um, I can't believe we're at 25 minutes right now. I mean, it's pretty much been the the the, the Mister Betcher show, and I and I appreciate that because this is something that I know you're extremely interested in. And it's something that I want to be interested in, but it's like, it's like waterboarding for me. I, I tried reading the chapter that you told me to read and I I'm reading it and it's just going right over my head because I don't do coding. I think I did a Java class in my university of Phoenix course five years ago. No, probably eight years ago. And unfortunately a lot of that's just kind of power dumped. And I'd really like to learn how to do code audits and do code audits successfully because I've worked at several companies where I think that could have been used to great advantage uh, because either code audits are being done with an automated tool, which, you know, most automated tools do okay. They find, say, 50 to 60 percent of the glaringly obvious stuff. But there's a bunch of stuff that, that makes it by because it's syntactically correct, but may not necessarily be programmatically correct, you know. Yes, those flaws are hard to find, and it and you know they can't be automated in most ca in a lot of cases. Now I have seen some uh, printouts from <clears throat> these mechanisms, and and I think it's uh, very valuable because you could see instantly, ah, oh, we have a potential buffer overflow here. So then you could either go look at it yourself or, or tell the developer, hey, uh, there may be a buffer overflow. Can you check it out? And they're being like, what, what, what's a buffer overflow or something like that? If you get that, then you can study up common weakness enumeration yep. or, um, or have them go to the site and, and look it up as well. But at least you'll know, you know, I don't expect everybody to be able to identify buffer overflows, but at least know what they are. Yeah. Right. And that's the purpose of this podcast is, is to get security people to know what some of these, you know, deadly sins, if you will, or weaknesses in code actually is. And, uh, some of the things that, that can be done about it. Now you've heard of uh, string copy, right? Uh, that yes. string copy came about, you know, maybe a couple of years ago or whatever. And, and it was, uh, it was a bad thing. You shouldn't do that anymore. Um, well, why? Well, can you guess why we don't use string copy? Uh, because it might have a buffer, buffer overflow. Overflow, it might cause yes. buffer overflows. Yes, it might cause a buffer overflow. Yes, it's unsafe because you could potentially copy values to a buffer that isn't large enough to hold them. I see. Right, that's why. So um, I think Windows or, or maybe the. C++, I think it was Windows, though, that, that did uh, stir copy S, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, they created to kind of mitigate it where you have ex to explicitly specify the size of the target buffer, right? And that's that's pretty much all that did there. But, you know, if you uh, practice good coding, um, you wouldn't have had that problem anyway. Yeah. I was uh, doing some C code the other day, and, and uh, you know, I just kind of found some reference in uh, you know I googled for it oh okay let me, let me try this so I copied it into um, my compiler and it blew up and said up oh, sorry it's using string copy you know I didn't even read all the code yeah because I was just testing uh, we're not gonna do this and then I had to go through and okay let me replace all the string copies with string copy underscore s and then my compiler was happy about oh, that nice. so and it wasn't it wasn't as simple as stir copy dash s because I had to go and either hard code the values or create constants or whatever it was to uh, create that new value, which was the size of the target. Mm, okay. Right. Okay. So what do you do about 
buffer overflows, right? How do you detect them? As security people, we need to be able to detect buffer overflows, right? Sure. In some cases. So um, you could make sure that proper input validation is happening. Mm. So if you have a function in, in some code that just uh, trusts that someone puts in those values properly, um, everybody, well, everybody in our industry should know, don't trust anybody. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So if you go to that website, don't trust them. Or if you accept user input, don't trust the input. You have to do checks. Mm -hmm. You have to validate yep. what your inputs are. Um, so one of the early languages I used was C++. And, uh, you know, it has uh, containers, which are unique to C++. They're not in C, but they're things like vector, list, um, that are pre-built. So instead of creating an array, you would create a vector and it has all those checks in it so you don't overflow those buffers, right? That's interesting. So is that is that something that is C++ specific or do other programming language? Obviously C doesn't have that because one thing I did get from this chapter was that C should only be used for like the lower level functions of, of the program while C++, uh, you know, say for user functions or, or whatever, should be using C++ for, for that because you have those kinds of memory protections in place and, and additional, uh, uh, additional goodies that can be used to secure the code. Yeah, so um, for example, if you're using Vector, um, it has those checks in place to where if I, it, I can use a, like a function called pushback, where I'm, I'm just pushing another value on to the end of the vector. And what it does behind the covers is it double, doubles the size of the vector if, if it didn't allocate enough memory to begin with. Mm -hmm. If you create a vector, let's say it creates a value of 10, and even though you may use one, two, or five of those, but if you start putting more uh, things into the vector, um, and you exceed 10, it'll create a new array of 20 behind the covers and, uh, you know, create those safeguards there. Okay. Yep. Wow. Well, so, um, go ahead. You know, I, I would love to go an hour long with this and maybe we'll turn this into another part of a podcast the next time. <laughs> But uh, due to time constraints, uh, we're going to have to kind of cut it a little short here. Um, is, is this something you want to do again next week for uh, for a podcast to kind of expand upon what we've learned today? No, that's that's this is enough. I mean, I just wanted, uh, you know, to educate myself and uh, others like you on what buffer overflows are so we can, uh, you know have a better foundation for security, right? Sure. And, you know, as, as big a deal as this is, I'm sure we can come back to it at any time and talk about it. Because um, there are things that we that we did not talk about, like, uh, you know, certain uh, protections in, the, in the, uh, the compiler. There's certain things in the OS levels that can help protect, like ASLR and uh, um, DEP, which is, um, dang it, I have yeah. it right here. Protections. You can do fuzzing testing. Yep. Uh, you can do boundary value analysis. Uh, you can use address randomization, just all kinds of things to help you uh, detect and prevent buffer overflows. Yep. So um, I know at some point we will come back and talk about those various things. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we had two long podcasts the last two weeks, so I thought maybe we'd have a little shorter one this time. Um, and... Uh, so, yeah, that that was uh, that was great. I learned a lot about what I don't know. So, um, I need to definitely well, get. There you go. I need I need to find some nice little program that I can go through and look at. And um, you know, there are code examples in the book. So if you are really wanting to understand that kind of code, you can you can get the book. I think it was like thirty some dollars on Amazon. I'll have a link to it in the show notes here. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great book uh, and a great reference as well. Yeah. And uh, it's something I keep around in case, um, you know, 
I, I'm looking through, um, you know, a report from some of these programs that do code audits and, uh, you know, I see something I can look in here and, uh, refresh my memory. Right. And, and something you mentioned before, um, the more, you know, how much you don't know. I mean, I, it seems like the smarter you get, the more you realize how incompetent you really are. I think that's true. Oh yeah. Yeah. I can definitely, <laughs> I definitely know that that's pretty much the last big stumbling block I have is understanding code and stuff like that. I think so. All right. Is that a wrap? I, I believe that is a wrap. Um, that uh, that was it for breaking down security this week. Uh, you can find Mr. Betcher and myself on Twitter at Brian Brake and at Betcher Pwned, uh, B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. Uh, you know, I just uh, you know, it's been about a week since we started our Patreon. Uh, that was kind of a big deal, and uh, we already have one person on there. Somebody named Brian from Seattle. Weird. Shout out to Brian, I guess. Uh, oh, you know, sweet. Yeah. So uh, we have a LinkedIn uh, LinkedIn page, Breaking Down Security on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find us there in the groups. Uh, our Facebook fan page is facebook.com forward slash Breaking Down Sec. And if you're in the Seattle area, um, myself and uh, Tot Tot uh, Totenkoff on Twitter have a group that we get together and go to restaurants in the area, and it's called CSEC East, and you can go to meetup.com and search for CSEC East and sign up and, and come out and have some dinner with us and have some light conversation, you know, with, uh, you know, like-minded security individuals, and, you know, it's good times. Uh, we just uh, had uh, our third meeting last month, and it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So uh, we try to have it uh, the uh, first Tuesday of every month, and you know if you if you want to you know come out have some drinks and and meet some people and network in the seattle area please feel free to hit us up so um that was it for breaking down security uh mr betcher uh is always available for um comments questions uh about coding and stuff so uh, you can hit him up at bds.podcast at gmail.com so everyone have a great week and we will talk to you later bye-bye